Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to all our viewers. Uh, my name is Nordin Muhammad Yusof. I am from the School of Mechanical Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. I'll be chairing today's 50th Distinguished Lecture Series program. We are indeed honored to have with us Professor Jawahir. Dr. Jawahir is the holder of the James F. Hardiman Chair in Manufacturing System. He is a professor of mechanical engineering and the director of Institute of Sustainable Manufacturing, University of Kentucky, Lexington, United States of America. Uh, Prof. Jawahir has been a dear friend to me. He has been to UTM and Malaysia several times, and uh, he has been assisting us in connecting with other distinguished in manufacturing. Uh, he has many friends in uh, Malaysia due to his frequent visit to UTM and Malaysia, and we are indeed honored to have with us uh, today. Uh, today, he will be delivering a lecture on advancing circular economy through digitally integrated, integrated sustainable manufacturing. I would like to invite our Dean, Professor Dato Engineer Dr. Muhammad Rafiq, Dato Abdul Kadeh, the Dean, Faculty of Engineering, uh, to deliver his welcoming remarks and introduce our speaker, Dato Rafiq. Thank you, Professor Nordin, for chairing the session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome, everyone, to our 50th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq, and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor I. S. Jawahir from University of Kentucky, Lexington, USA. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Dr. I.S. Jawahir is a professor of mechanical engineering, James F. Hardiman Endowed Chair in Manufacturing Systems, and the founding director of the Institute for Sustainable Manufacturing at the University of Kentucky, Lexington, USA. Professor Jawahir's current research activities include sustainable product design and manufacturing processes. His early pioneering work on product and process design for sustainability and sustainable manufacturing processes focusing on dry, near-dry, and cryogenic machining, processing of materials, are well recognized worldwide. He has produced over 440 technical research papers, including over 145 referee journal papers, and has been awarded with four U.S. patents. He has also delivered 65 keynote papers at plenary sessions in major international conferences and over 150 invited presentations in 37 countries. Professor Jawahir is a fellow of three major professional societies, CIRP, International Academy for Production Engineering, ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and SME, Society of Manufacturing Engineers. He is the founding editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Sustainable Manufacturing and the technical editor of the Journal of Machining Science and Technology. Professor Jawahir founded the CIRP International Conference Series on Modeling of Machining Operations in 1998, and this conference series still continues. And the 17th conference in this series was recently held in Sheffield, United Kingdom in June 2019. Professor Jawahir founded the CIRP's International Working Group on surface integrity in 2007 and served as the chairman of this collaborative research group for four years. In 2005, he, had, he also founded the ASME's Research Committee on Sustainable Products and Processes and served as the founding chairman for six years. He also co-founded the CIRP conference series on surface integrity in 2012. He is also a founding member of another successful CIRP sponsored major international conference series, the Global Conference on Sustainable Manufacturing. In October 2018, 
Professor Jawahir organized and hosted the 16th conference in this series in Lexington, USA, and served as the conference chairman. Professor Jawahir received numerous awards and honors for his research and academic achievement over the years. Most recent awards include the 2013 ASME Milton C. Shaw Manufacturing Research Medal for his outstanding research contributions to fundamental understanding of sustainable manufacturing processes and the 2015 William Johnson International Gold Medal for his lifelong achievements and contributions to materials processing research and education. Professor Jawahir also received the 2015 Dean's Award for Research Excellence at the University of Kentucky and in 2017, he was also named as the 2017 University Research Professor at the University of Kentucky. So that is a biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor I.S. Jawahir from University of Kentucky, Lexington, USA, with a talk entitled Advancing Circular Economy Through Digitally Integrated Sustainable Manufacturing. Professor Jawahir, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Muhammad Rafiq and also Professor Nurdin Yusuf. And I'm very privileged to participate in this uh, distinguished lecture series. And, and when I was uh, asked to make a presentation, I gladly accepted this invitation because uh, UTM has been very close to my heart. I've been to many other Malaysian universities and I have friends in every university. UTM is very special to me. That's the university I have visited most number of times in Malaysia. So with that, uh, I want to get started with the topic uh, by sharing my screen on PowerPoint mode. Can you see my PowerPoint now, please? Yes, yes, Prof. Can we you can see my see. PowerPoint, please? Yes, you can. You can proceed, Prof. We can see. Okay. We had some difficulties initially. Hopefully, it's uh, over now. So as you see here, the title is a little long here. I'm trying to connect uh, three emerging topics in this title. One is obviously the circular economy, which is... Uh, a very new phenomenon for the last uh, 20, 25 years or so. And uh, uh, the other one is uh, emerging technology, digital technology. Third one is, of course, uh, also again, 20 some years old, uh, sustainable manufacturing. There are a lot of commonalities between the three topics. I think one drives the others. You're going to see at the end of this presentation how these three topics can be very nicely connected together. Uh, in this opening slide, I have, uh, apart from my affiliation here, I have number of uh, created pictures here. When you, when anybody talks about sustainability, people think about solar panels and uh, wind turbines and uh, and uh, various uh, power systems. When anybody talks about manufacturing, what comes to our mind is aerospace manufacturing and automotive manufacturing. And, uh, and the collage of these uh, pictures uh, eventually try to uh, give an idea how these advanced technologies, when digitally integrated, can benefit all of the manufacturing industries. Because presently, I'm showing here only automotive and aerospace industries. And also the Professor Nurdin and Professor Mohammed Rafiq uh, uh, basically challenged me to connect my topic with uh, some of those uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Many years ago, United, Nation, United Nations put together 17 major sustainable development goals. These are universally applicable to all countries of the United Nations. And of which I found uh, there are many uh, connections here I can bring in, but of which I found uh, three particular topics, three particular goals uh, relate to my presentation today. One is uh, goal number nine, industry innovation and uh, infrastructure. Second one is uh, number 11, which is uh, sustainable cities and communities. Uh, then the next one, next one uh, that comes uh, close to my topic is uh, number 12, which is... Uh, 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 basically, uh, responsible consumption and production. With that introduction, I want to uh, take you to the next slide to show the history of civilization, industrial civilization, as it has gone through a number of uh, centuries now, starting with in the very first industrial revolution, uh, mm -hmm. moving into automation, and then coming into mass production in industry two. Industry three uh, basically introduced automation and computer-based technologies and electronics. The current industry 4.0 is characterized by cyber physical systems, internet of things, big data, data analytics, and all these things come to play here. 
So with this uh, re uh, revolution that is currently taking place, I believe it's going to go on for another few decades. Uh, I want to go a little deeper into what is Industry 4.0. Many of you are uh, probably maybe an expert on this. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Just to show on the left-hand side, when suppliers and logistics and computers servers uh, connected together with sensors and digital production, that is uh, a part of my presentation today, the cyber physical system kicks in. In the cyber physical system, facilitated by digital technologies and sensor-based uh, techniques, with physical production, when it's applied, uh, will have the capability to provide customized products uh, with uh, virtual production environment and also smart and sustainable uh, manufacturing to take place. And to go a little deeper into it, uh, some representatives, I, representative icons I have selected here to show the major manufacturing segments. Of course, there are multiple. I'm just picking a few here to show automotive, aerospace, and few food industries and and uh, also uh, process industries and heavy man heavy engineering and industrial manufacturing segments altogether. With this, now we are confronted with the global issues. Global issues are multiple here. We need to have clean air, clean water, and clean, clean soil to continue with our human civilization. And we have ample evidence for water pollution, air pollution, landfills uh, growing uh, alarmingly and waste being generated on a daily basis being dumped into landfills. Emissions emissions and toxicities with uh, uh, ecological footprint increasing. With global warming, you see the glaciers disappearing with global warming, warming increasing all the time. With the world population uh, fast approaching 10 billion by 2050, it is going to increase by about 50% from where we are now. So we're going to be stuck with too little to be shared by too many people, too many humans. So what does it mean? Does it mean that we need to consume less? We need to produce less space? And there is some part of it, but I think we need to produce more to be able to leave behind more for the future generation. That's the message that we have from this uh, large collated slide. And uh, the common misconception when anybody talks about su sustainability is Sustainability is uh, sustainment. That's not true. And the old school of thought always thinks sustainability is all about uh, maintaining the three P's. People, planet and prosperity. People meaning the society, planet meaning the environment, prosperity meaning the economy. Economy and the and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the economic well-being. That's the old school of thought. If we can maintain the status quo, that means within the eco boundaries, within what we can achieve within the eco boundaries, if all that we can take from the ecosystem can be consumed, that means it's an eco-balance. Eco-balance is essentially sustainment. It doesn't leave behind anything for future generation. In my mind, actually, when I challenged one of my graduate students some 15 years ago, it was an Italian student who spent some time here. And student went ahead and found a very good example for me. That the example I'm using it, I'm showing it to you right now on this slide, to show a well-grown well tree with hundreds of millions, thousands of millions of fruits, flowers, and leaves, very healthy tree that you see. That whole tree starts from one single seed. The seed is in your hand. When you plant that one single seed, the seed becomes a plant, plant becomes a tree. Tree has hundreds of thousands of millions of fruits and flowers and seeds coming up annually, periodically, to produce much more. So that's the extent of uh, sustainability going in an exponential fashion. As you see, this uh, growing arrow that I show on the right hand side within which I have placed this tree. So the sustainable sustainment is a status quo. We're trying to change the status quo into sustainability, being able to produce sustainability. It's not just uh, having a piece of fish and eating that fish. We are trying to teach people how to fish for, for, for the human civilization to go on. And again, when we talk about sustainability, I'm going very slow here to, to bring some understanding for some of your participants uh, on the fundamentals. Then I'm going to go a little faster. Sustainability has multiple dimensions and scales. In this diagram, let's start from the bottom. Products like a car or a computer or a train or an airplane or even military equipment can be produced with each and every component coming in there. Just to give an example of this car picture, that icon that you see here, 
people won't probably realize that a simple automobile will have more than 3,000 components built in there. The question here is, are we making each and every component sustainable? The answer is not. We are focusing on hybrid cars. What is it, hybrid cars or electric cars? These are only a few components or assemblies that are being considered as major. The rest of it is not. I think it's going to take several years, maybe several decades for us to get each and every component coming into the, in the car to make it sustainable. To go from product to process, we need to have processes to make these products. Then go to the system enterprise level or plant level. Then go to the local level. Local level, I picked up my beautiful state of Kentucky here to show it's local. It's one of the 50 states in the United States. Then go to the national level. You see the American flag there waving. And that's a national level. They go to the global or international level. It's a multi, much higher level. That's why we, we brought in this uh, conference that uh, Professor Rafiq introduced about, uh, we started a conference called Global Conference. We didn't even want to call it a national law or even international conference. We wanted to call it a global. We, know, we want to have the conference to serve the whole global system. The sustainability can go on varying levels and scales. In this presentation, unfortunately, I have to limit to products, processes, and system, which is the foundation to go on building the sustainability system upwards. And uh, in an elaborated picture, uh, I, I show here the three elements of manufacturing, products, processes, and system. I'm going to relate to these uh, terms uh, frequently. You'll see probably a few times. You will hear from me a few dozen times, maybe. You'll hear from me these words, products, processes, and system. I don't need to describe, but these are probably anyone and everyone who is in manufacturing will understand this. I'm going to limit myself to a plant level within the four walls of the plant, not even going go to the factory level or branches. And to look at the sustainable development progress in the United Nations in the late 80s when uh, Harlan, Go Harlan Brundtland, the Norwegian Prime Minister was charged with the responsibility to come up with the definition for sustainable development. She came up with a very nice de definition to include three elements, economy, environment and society. It took almost like 20 years, more than two decades, for people to realize that the technology connects it. Technology is the only thing that can connect these three elements. It took another 10 years for people to realize technology alone cannot solve this. You need human resources. Human resources and technology goes side by side. When you add by innovation, creativity, and education and training, the sustainable development comes to exist. Over a period of time, last few decades, sustainable development has given sustainable agriculture, sustainable transportation, and sustainable energy, and multiple disciplines. I'm going to go through fast. All these icons are being popped up here. And the last, last icon that I popped up here is the sustainable manufacturing one. Why I did that was its area that's close to my heart. Also, the, the most significant striking reality is that sustainable manufacturing is one topic that connects multiple topics altogether. See the, the blue arrows that are going encompassing multiple sustainability elements here, whether it's the transportation or housing or waste management or architecture or, or, or energy. All of this is connected by manufacturing. Manufacturing, therefore, plays a very central role in bringing up the connectivity of multiple sustainability elements. With that, I'm going to start next few slides uh, with the definition for sustainable manufacturing. There is obviously no universal acceptable definition that's agreed upon by every country. The journey started in 2009, 2009 rather. 2009 used the Department of Commerce uh, commissioned 20 people, 10 people from the university, 10 others from industry to come up with a common definition for sustainable manufacturing. I happen to be one of those who was invited to attend a series of meetings in Washington, D.C., and have a number of uh, conference calls. At the end of nine months, it took multiple meetings and, and discussion and debates and often heated arguments. At the end of nine months, we came up with a three-line definition for sustainable manufacturing. You know what? It took only three more weeks for us to degree on, uh, disagree on the definition. We thought the definition is ill-defined. Then, of course, NACFAM, the, the civil advoc the, the manufacturing advocacy group in Washington came up on the same, in the same year, a little updated definition. From then onwards, the journey on developing definitions started with NIST starting the next workshop series. Uh, it's, NIST means the National Institute for Standards and Technology. A lot of the references are making it for uh, United States and North America. That's where a lot of good development took place. 
I'm not really undermining the development that took place in Europe or elsewhere, but the definition part actually mostly comes from US. Then in the uh, around uh, 2008-2010, uh, ASM, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, uh, where we, I had the responsibility as a chairman for a working group on sustainable products and processes, I've been asked to come up with a series of workshops. We had a number of workshops, two major workshops that produced these two reports that you see on the slide. 2011 and 2014, we redefined sustainable manufacturing. Then NSF, National Science Foundation, picked up. Then our conference series, obviously the conference series that was started in 2003. In 2013, that was held in Berlin, Germany. We updated the definition. Uh, a year later, we were fortunate to have another workshop that was held in my home university here, sponsored by NIST, where the industry, academia, and also the, the, the federal agencies came together. 45 people got together for three, two and a half days. We updated the definition. With that definition, I'm going to go to the exact definition by skipping the couple of slides, I, a couple of bullets I have here. The last definition that we came up with has five elements. First, uh, our definition of sustainable manufacturing covers product, process, and system. The five elements are the sustainable manufacturing in each of the three elements has to demonstrate reduce negative environmental impact. The next element is it has to offer improved energy and resource efficiency. When I say resource, resource efficiency, that includes water, air, and other uh, supplies that goes into manufacturing processes for producing components. Then the third element, it has to generate minimum quantity of waste, which is obviously, as many of you know, is the basis for lean manufacturing. I'm going to come down to that in a while. And the fourth element is it's, it has to provide operational safety and the fifth being the personal health. All of these five elements have to be satisfied without compromising the product or process quality by maintaining or improving the overall life cycle benefits. The definition looks very cumbersome, very, very uh, long and extensive. But I think it's very simple to remember. And uh, all of those who are talking about sustainable manufacturing are talking about several of the ex expectations that I have here. The general expectations include reducing energy consumption, reducing water use, re reducing waste, or improving, optimizing uh, material utilization, reducing the emissions, toxicity, and goes on. And the integral elements of manufacturing, as I mentioned a little earlier, was uh, products, processes, and system. When we connect these three together, we almost come to the need to force ourselves into closed loop sustainable manufacturing leading into circular economy. That's the other two topics that I'm trying to connect here. So now I'm going to go a little faster because some of these slides are very fundamental. These are available in the published literature, particularly from our group and elsewhere. And the closed loop begins with four life cycle stages. For our convenience, we made each of the stages as a quadrant of a circle. The first stage is extracting materials and processing the material to make them as raw materials to be able to use them as raw materials for actual discrete product manufacture or unit production. And that's the second quadrant, which is manufacturing. Third quadrant is the use, which is the large one. Even though we call it as one quadrant, that's the largest stage of product life cycle stage. The most problematic one comes at the end of the use cycle, when the product is used up, when the product stop becoming, when the product becomes uh, obsolete or, or non-functional. That's when the problem begins. That's when the post-use stage begins. We have to retire the product. We need to uh, successfully and peacefully and, 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 and toxic-free way uh, dispose the product or, or get the re-evaluation uh, re re of the product or whatever is remaining from the product. The closed-loop manufacturing kicks in in this uh, animated slide by taking the resources, particularly the raw material, water and things like that, along with energy, to force the system into four life cycle stages that you see here, and eventually to produce the product and as byproduct from these uh, manufacturing processes to put back waste and emissions. The way I'm showing here is very dramatic. From the ecosystem that's green and rich and, and uh, resourceful, we are taking too much of raw materials and too much of energy, and then we are putting back into the ecosystem too much of waste and too much of emissions. It doesn't look like sustainable. If you take the good stuff out and put back the bad stuff, the world become unlivable, world become unsustainable. 
So we need to do something about it. This was this is what prompted us to create some six R based technologies, starting with the one R. One R is the lean technology, which is reduced. In the 90s, when Environmental Protection Agency in the United States introduced the three R's in the 1990s, reduce, reuse, recycle. That partially solved the problem, but it's not solving, solving the entire post-use stage. Then we created about 15 years ago, this additional three additional R's to consider recovery as one of the stage, then redesigning of next generation products and processes, then remanufacturing. When you put all six in, in sequential fashion, in perspective, what you are doing is we are siphoning out whatever is left from the previous generation to go into this perpetual or almost near perpetual material flow to make sure that we produce minimum waste and minimum emissions and we optimally use the resources that are taken from the ecosystem. I think physically, philosophically, spiritually and religiously, all these concepts are very powerful. But we need science to drive this. So that's what uh, drives people like uh, manufacturing researchers, sustainable manufacturing researchers to produce masters and PhDs and publications to generate algorithm, mathematics, computer programs, and predictive models. With that, um, I'm going to show you the historic perspective to show the traditional manufacturing and uh, came in the 80s when Toyota system introduced the lean manufacturing concept, then came the green in the 90s with three R's reduced reuse recycle. Then, of course, you see here the sustainable manufacturing 6R. Some of us literally believe that the 6Rs are falling from the heaven for us to catch it and use it. And the animation slide shows you the 6Rs are blessings coming from uh, the revelations of all types for humans to take advantage of. Each of the 6R has innovation aspect. And uh, in a dramatic fashion, when you see the first life cycle that you see in this orange line, take the materials, produce the products, use the products. And in this case, a big monster called airplane, which, which is a product, which has got not 3,000 components. You see in an aircraft, I'm going to surprise you here. The rivets that connect all the sheet metal in an aircraft, you know how many? More than a million. More than a million rivet components are there in an aircraft, typical aircraft. I'm not speaking of any other components. I'm going to come down to the aircraft engine in a while. Then we subject the second, subject the system into the second life cycle. That's what you see in this blue sets of closed loops, starting with the hub. A uh, hub is a recovery. You recover from the end of first generation, whatever you can recover as residual material or resource and force the system into reusing, which is the best value you can get if you can reuse it. Then redesign the next generation products and processes and remanufacture. If you can't do any one of these three R's, then obviously the rest goes into recycling. And it's, it's the myth and, and bad perception to believe that sustain, sustainability is all about recycling. You, you're going to see in, a, in an example, numerical example in a while, the recycling gives you, recycling aspect of the 6R gives you the lowest revenue that's possible compared to the other five R options. Recycling is, on, is not the only option. That's the least preferable option I'm going to show you. And the historical perspective, when it's put in perspective for evolution in the 80s, the one R concept basically has no consideration of post-use. Everything goes into this dustbin or landfill that we call. When the green revolution came, it reduces, the lean concept came and it reduces the traditional manufacturing reduces the amount of waste that are produced. Then the green concept came, it gives the three closed loop, reduce, reuse, recycle. The sizes of the closed close loops are approximately the volume of uh, revenue, volume or revenues that can be generated. Then the sustainable manufacturing came, you see the, the closed loop, multiple closed loop with the thicknesses showing the economic revenues. With that, uh, I'm showing the, this is supposed to be an animated diagram because the time limit, I'm showing it all in one, it's in published literature you can find, showing the connectivity of the four life cycle stages and 6R and the logical flow chart to show how you can force the system to make decision, these uh, diamond shaped uh, blocks are decision makers, whether a, a product is recoverable, reusable, remanufacturable or recyclable, all these decisions are, decisions are made 
not just from the material point of view, also from the information point of view. That's where the digital revolution comes to play a major role. The dotted line that I'm showing in this diagram is the digital part where the new generation, new the information is put into computer system to be able to provide a, per, a perpetual data system. Now I'm putting in perspective to show on the left hand side the six R, on the right hand side the sustainability elements to show economy, environment and and, 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 and the society. And now we, we, we get the resources taken from the earthly resources and, and uh, manufacture the products. And if the product is a, a single or linear system, it goes into landfill. I must tell you that this diagram is uh, drawn with uh, care, but uh, it's not my intention to show that resources are taken from the Asia and dumped into Australia. Please don't feel that way. It is my convenience that I selected the large ocean part, which is the Pacific Ocean, which is um, uh, uh, where I can put some of the text here. So it's actually from earthly resources that the, all the raw materials go into the manufacturing system and the waste is being dumped into the ecosystem, not necessarily on the Australian soil. Those of you who are from Australia, please don't get offended. So now the circular economy comes to kick in. The closed loop comes in multiple forms to introduce these six R's in a different way. And, and when you do that, we are forcing the raw materials and all the inputs going in the form of information that will be transformed into digital information eventually into a perpetual cycle. So that's the connection that I'm trying to show in this presentation. Now a few slides I need to show you the circular economy for those of those of you who have not heard about this word. Circular economy is one of the very frequently cited word. And it was originally introduced by two British researchers in the early 90s. And the current practice at that time was take, make, use and dispose. The four stages, take everything possible from resources, make products and use them and dispose them. And these two British scientists uh, showed that uh, that's not sustainable. Maybe you need to take, make, use, and reuse, and regenerate, and put in perspective. The two different uh, uh, philosophies that I introduced, I am showing on the left and right. And there was a nice statement that I borrowed from somebody. It says, uh, today's goods are tomorrow's resources at yesterday's price. This is an ideal version. I think we are not there yet, but I think that's the level that we are trying to reach. This uh, particular diagram is a complex looking but simple diagram which was introduced by Ellen MacArthur Foundation in England many years ago. This diagram is generally known as butterfly diagram. It looks like a butterfly, beautiful butterfly with color graphics. The color graphic uh, close loop that you see on the right hand side is a technology cycle. What you see on the left hand side is a biological cycle. They show the merging, convergence of these two cycles together. What uh, they have shown here is the computer technology can connect this and make it much more effective. That's the intention of my presentation today to show at the end that uh, this circular economy concept can be advanced through digital technology. One of my former graduate students who is a sustainability coordinator for Amazon right now, very, very, very brilliant, brilliant young American engineer, put together this diagram for one of the presentations I made uh, two years ago in Japan. Uh, to show multi-generational product when you hop from one level to another level. You see three different generation of products I'm showing, more like three different models of a car or three different models of a, a cell phone that you use, generation one to generation two to generation three. So obviously you are forcing the system to go into much more resource efficient technologies and much more, much less wasteful uh, methodologies to be produced. So that's uh, the leapfrogging that's shown in this diagram. And much more recently, uh, we came across uh, this innovative method to go from, uh, uh, conce uh, from conceptually from linear to circular to helical economy concept. This concept is not there yet. Only a couple of publications we have put together. And there is a US patent being, up, uh, being uh, processed right now. Actually, a few weeks ago, we just applied for a US patent to go for transforming the linear economy into circular and advancing the circular economy to make it helical. In this diagram, what you're seeing is the, the, the horizontal, the axis of rotation that is the black line is the linear economy. That's only one way. Uh, there's, uh, there's no way to return. The circular economy is a red circle that you see shown in an elliptical form. We are trying to turn that helix into multiple helix 
going into spiral form in a helical direction by changing the three axes are economic development, sustainable value creation, and also the prosperity of the society. We have mathematical equations for this. I'm not showing this in the slides. In the slides, it's too much to show. And couple of ne next couple of slides shows the fundamentals here. Uh, we can uh, just this slide shows the product innovation using digital technology. The difference you see is very contrasting here. In a linear product manufacturing situation, you make the product, use the product, and landfill it. That's very simple. As bad as that. In a in a circular product, you have a, a, a two or three closed loop options given to you: reuse option and recycling option. Of course, more recently they have also introduced remanufacturing option that is not shown in this slide. And the helical option, you have multiple closed loop coming into re recovering, redesigning the next generation product and reconfiguring the manufacturing system to make it much more sustainable. In doing so, we hope in years to come, maybe a few decades, we are going to reach landfill less, emission less, toxicity less manufacturing, which is clean, environmentally toxic free, health-wise much more friendly and also economically much more beneficial to society for making sustainable living. That's the direction we are moving in. Just to show this uh, process level, the linear process have a simple input-output system. You take materials and take energy and other resources and produce products, obviously, and also produce waste and toxicities. The circular products Manufacturing, you have a little bit of closed loop. Your two closed loops you are showing here for reusing and recycling. The helical products has much more complex system where uh, helical processes can be self-sustaining. Now I'm coming to a real example. I know all this is theory or philosophy or fundamental concept. Now I'm going to show you the reality. The reality is that when uh, Boeing introduced the 777 uh, sometime in the in in the mid 90s i happened to see the plant i think it was 1996 when i went for a conference in seattle washington as part of the conference asme conference they took us to show the boeing plant they were assembling 777 777 had only 12 percent composite and 50 percent aluminum years later when they introduced the boeing dreamliner which is 787 about 50% composite, it has gone up to 12% has become 50%. Aluminum content reduced somewhat. Actually, titanium component is there and, and also steel and other material comes in. To make lightweight more sustainable is the direction that they are going. In doing so, they are also learning to make products and components sustainable. As much as they are improving the fuel technology, they are also improving the process technology and product technology. Now I'm showing a complex animal called aircraft engine. Many of you know, wouldn't have seen this uh, opened up section. There are hundreds of components coming from 52 different materials. 52 different literally materials are involved in fan blades to turbine blades to and, and rotors and, and uh, lots and lots of housings and things like that. Multiple levels of turbine blades are shown with uh, low temperature chamber to high temperature chamber, high pressure engines and things like that. Many of these materials that are listed here, like infernal, titanium alloys, and composite materials uh, for fan blades, have been tested in multiple labs, including our labs. So, in never, never, in, in an attempt, in a tireless attempt, or attempt to automotive manufacturers, uh, as well as aeros aerospace manufacturers, particularly for these engine components, are trying their best to produce sustainable materials, sustainable processes and sustainable logistics and enterprise system to make the whole manufacturing sustainable. Lightweight is one of those trends. The case study that we did, uh, my former student, uh, as part of his uh, early studies at, in his uh, PhD work, he compared three different materials that are used for a particular component for confidentiality sake. I can't identify the component. I can give you the numbers related to which component, which one. All that you see in this, uh, in this table is a uh, Mechanical engineering properties, starting with Young's modulus, density, strength, and ultimate tensile strength, and hardness, and whatnot. Three different materials are by, considered by property. These are actual properties of three materials. Three materials are considered in a case study 
for material selection and more importantly, material substitution. That's the thing that's taking place in all industries. Materials are being replaced on a daily basis with more sustainable materials. And the uh, objectives are here for consumer is, uh, customer is uh, that uh, acquisition cost or product cost, usage cost or maintenance cost. And also uh, incentivization factor is added there. When you put this uh, data, real data into use, the life cycle cost benefit, which is the vertical axis, is plotted against the percentage of material being re recycled. You see the comp complete uh, contrast here for one material being superior to the other two. When you put the three aspects of uh, three R's actually, recycling, remanufacturing, and, and reusing, obviously the reusing and remanufacturing op options come out to be the best cost saver. Life cycle cost benefits are standing out to be very strong as the graph grows exponentially high. The recycling option, as I said a little while ago, is the least uh, preferable option, which is the last, the bottom line here. With that, I'm going to show you next few minutes some of the metrics based analysis that we have done. I know I'm kind of pretty close to <coughs> my presentation time. I think I will probably wind up in about uh, 10, 10 minutes or less. Metrics based evaluation basically identified uh, we had a large project funded by National Institute of Standards and Technology for four years. A few of my PhD students and my colleagues worked on it. We came up with uh, metrics for products and processes. We came up with 93 metrics classified into 13 clusters. See, these green blocks are 13 clusters arranged in economic, environmental, and societal categories. And these 13 clusters put in this circle are being evaluated for life cycle analysis with six hours being applied. When you put together these clusters, we learned how to design product considering the metrics. This animated slide, I think, takes a little bit more time for you to understand. Product sustainability considerations are put forward upfront when the product is designed in the first place. Environmental impact, resource efficiency factor, safety aspect, health aspect, product functionality and also manufacturability, including the maintenance being considered. Then the four life cycle stages are being considered in design for sustainability. That's when the traditional design phase enters. What we saw on the, uh, on the left hand side in the previous uh, stage are some of the new elements we added. Then comes the next stage, modeling, predictive modeling or predictive design is uh, one of the topics that's emerging now. With the digital technology kicking in now, digital integration comes in the form of closed loop by considering the design features, material aspect, and the manufacturing processes going back and forth in an interactive way to serve the designers to have the knowledge. In the olden days, we had two different categories of engineers called one is a design engineer, the other one is called process planner. These are the two, uh, the process planner is more like a bouncing board stuck between the designers and manufacturers. If anything goes wrong with manufacturing, manufacturers blame the process planner, process planner in, in turn blames the designer and vice versa. Now the bouncing ball is being eliminated. Product designer takes the role of a process planner. Designing and process planning roles are merged together through digital technology, being connected with the manufacturing world to make the product. And optimization kicks in there optimized design that comes from this interaction between the designers, process planners, and manufacturers gives you the op optimized sustainable product design. And that's the optimized design that leads to advancing circular economy. So this conceptual diagram that I'm showing for product design is the thing that I think we developed about three years ago and uh, we have published a few papers. If anyone wants to have publications, we'd be glad to send us if you send an email to us and I'll be glad to do that. Now I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on the process element. There are six elements we identified for manufacturing process. They're all digitally connected. Environmental aspect, personal health, safety, waste management, energy consumption, and the cost. These are also classified into six different clusters with multiple metrics coming in. And for example, the energy aspect, if you consider line level, workstation level, operation level, and ideally, this is the type of uh, diagram that you need to post for every operation on every machine for every, every, every product. We are not there yet. 
to show the six elements, the level of sustainability represented by the length of the bar chart. The spider chart or bar chart that you see here, the, the longer the bar chart is, the more the process is sustainable. You see here, we are short on waste reduction. We are short on operational safety. We have room to improve. The color coding that's shown here, the dark color being the worst case scenario to turn into light green color, the best case scenario shows. For every operation that's being designed and developed and processed, if you can come up with a chart like this, that's an ideal form. The mathematical function that uh, my students uh, developed for product sustainability and process sustainability is very lengthy. That goes into this spider chart. The spider chart, what you see on the left hand side is PROC, Product Sustainability Index in terms of the 13 clusters that are peripherally arranged. For each of the cluster, we can identify the sustainability level of the product. On the right hand side, what you see is the six clusters that, are, that we identified for processes. The sustainability levels are shown here. These are still highly idealized. They have no real data. When you put the real data into these three products, one is an automotive product called crankshaft, complex looking component crankshaft. We work with uh, one of the US, uh, actually Japanese automakers called Toyota. We have uh, the largest manufacturing plant in the world is fortunately located in the state where I am working, Kentucky, uh, where they produce uh, 2200 cars in one day. So they, uh, they were kind enough to allow my students to go and work there and, and come up with a nice analysis for them to look at the life cycle stages and sustainability index. Automotive man the auto aerospace manufacturer who, whom we had close by here is in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, uh, G, G aircraft manufacturer. These engines are used very heavily in multiple aircraft. And they gave us a case study of a fan blade made from metal, titanium, and a composite, two materials combined together. So we did the life cycle analysis for aerospace components. Also, we selected the toner cartridge component for a laser printer manufacturer, which is also a local company here, Lexmark. So when you put this to use and we could get the benefits. And next slide, I'm going to show you very fast. The sustainable machining processes, which is close to my heart, our heart actually, some of us, including Professor Nudin, has worked for many, many years in this area. Dry machining was introduced in the 50s and 60s and the 70s with the coated cutting tools that has been the subject of many of our research introduce the near dry machining or minimum quantity lubrication. Then in the 90s, uh, the cryogenic uh, machining process was introduced as the cleanest possible process available to us until now for the last 20, 25 years. The, the significant fact that we learned is the cryogenic machining process gives the product with preferred microstructures or even nanostructures where a coarse microstructure can be created into preferred microstructures with preferred hardness, residual stresses, wear resistance and corrosion resistance for product, product to last longer. In other words, to make sustainable products. So ideally we are leading into sustainable products to be manufactured for use in aircraft industry, automotive industry, power industry, even in biomedical industry. What you see here, a range of uh, materials that we have used to produce these components using these sustainable technologies, dry to near dry to sustainable technologies, making sustainable products from sustainable processes. Now I'm coming to last couple of slides to connect with the digital technology in the era of industry 4.0. Smart factories of next generation, we are not just the products, process and system, Beyond the four walls of the companies, at industry level, supply chain level, we had to connect it. That level of connectivity is already taking place. My colleague, uh, Professor Badruddin, some of you at UTM will know her. She has been to UTM. She has given some lectures and also participated in one of the review process there many years ago. Uh, she is almost like my right hand here and in my Institute uh, for Sustainable Manufacturing. She and a colleague of ours, a former colleague of ours, who is a professor of uh, business and supply chain. They are writing a book uh, for Cambridge University Press, as much as I've been writing also for many years, a book on sustainable manufacturing. Both, both books will be available, hopefully, inshallah, next year. As part of the publication uh, in this book, she has produced this diagram to show 
how digitally integrated supply chain can contribute to circular economy. There is a publication being produced right now, and more importantly, she is showing here the six R elements coming into contact with four life cycle stages, connecting with the suppliers in the front end and the back end. We call uh, kind of uh, upstream and downstream suppliers mm -hmm. to connect multiple companies together to make sustainable products for sustainable manufacturing to be able to improve circular economy. Now I'm coming to the very last slide. You're going to be very pleased to see these four bullets. The four bullets are that I was trying to make a, a clear understanding here in my presentation of several slides to show that next generation manufacturing which is aimed at industry 4.0 requires digitally integrated sustainable technologies and systems. In the second bullet I'm summarizing here that implementing and advancing circular economy principles for sustainable living of the future for all of our human being has become not just a reality or fact of life, but is rather a necessity that cannot be ignored anymore. In the third bullet I'm showing the technology that we introduced many years ago, 15 years ago, the 6R based technological elements of sustainable manufacturing will continue to play a major role in advancing and progressing the circular economy principles and practices, taking us from linear to circular to helical economy system. Then the last bullet what I'm saying here is uh, digitally integrated sustainable manufacturing concepts are truly emerging as transformative technologies. Transformative is substantially revolutionary technologies. They offer much stronger foundation for next generation workforce development, including engineers, scientists, social scientists, and everybody. And the takeaway message from my presentation is in this red block. The red hot takeaway message here is the convergence of digital technologies with sustainable manufacturing offers the best possible means so far available to us for advancing circular economy. With that, I'm going to close my presentation, Professor Rafik. Sorry, I've taken a little more. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jawahir, for a very informative and uh, on the leading edge research uh, that has been uh, done at the Institute of Sustainable Manufacturing at the University of Kentucky. Um, there are a few questions. I think I've, I've, I've seen the um, comments in the Facebook. Uh, there was one question that struck me very much, mm -hmm. uh, which is, um, I think, can you see it on the screen from Prof Shari? Yes, yes. You remember Prof Shari? Okay, I know Prof Shari, yes. He's a good friend of ours. He was at the UTM campus in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Yes, My yes. Friend. So, yeah, you, you can read the question. Maybe you can answer the question, Prof? Prof Shari, very, very good to hear from you, my friend. Uh, your question, and let me read the question here for the benefit of everybody. How do we transform to sustainable ecosystem or even circular economy when the current existing condition of manufacturing system in a country is still industry 2.0 or 2.5 level? This is a fundamental question. This is a very good question, not just for developing and emerging countries like Malaysia or Indonesia or even Singapore. This is the question for everybody. Even United States, the most developed country in the world, they say we are struggling with this technology. I think we need to make progress in multiple fronts. I think the education and training is the key. And when the lean concepts came in the 80s, people thought that they got a lottery ticket falling uh, on their grounds to make benefit. That didn't help. When the green technologies came, that gave a, glim a glimpse of hope that didn't happen. Sustainable technologies are next best technologies that we have. But we need to do is we, we as educators and researchers, we had to continue to do research and transform the research into educational programs and disseminate the new knowledge into workforce development. And this challenge all of us have. This is going to continue in any country, including United States or European Union countries. 
these uh, industry 2.0, 2.5, and 3 are still continuing. We need to work on for parallel fronts. We cannot lose the sight of technology just because we have old technology. We need to continue to make progress. I'm sorry, I didn't give a full answer. That's the best answer I have, my friend. Thank you. I thank you very much. I can't hear him. I can't see him. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the answer. Um, maybe, Prof, can you share with us uh, some of the uh, activities, research activities that are being undertaken at the Institute of Sustainable Manufacturing? Based on your sharing, you know, uh, it looks like there are numerous work being done there. Maybe you can share with us on the activities of the Institute. I'll give some examples of, I, I should have had some slides I didn't have. I was running short of uh, time for my presentation. Let me briefly explain at three levels, product level, process level, and system level. I showed one slide to show uh, how digital technologies help us to develop a predictive design, which is closed loop design. We have some PhD students. Uh, we also produced some PhDs recently, including the one who is a superstar who works for Amazon technology. Uh, he and I are getting this patent on helical economy and uh, the work that uh, one of my one of our PhD students uh, currently completing uh, his work is on predictive design through interactive uh, design process. The old technology is uh, is one way. Products are designed, processes are developed and planned and manufactured. Product is manufactured and uh, put in the use stream. And now we we are learning to digitize the information coming from the user face or post-use face of a product. From the failure of a product or from the success of a product, we can learn how to bring the information to the design table to design the next generation product to make it better. And uh, an advanced uh, technology that uh, that's being developed uh, by our group in conjunction with some others uh, that's also being patented is to put a uh, something like an RFID tag on each and every product is happening in some areas already. When a product is being used, whether it's a washing machine or dishwasher or cooktop or, or anything that you call domestic or industrial, the, uh, the tag that's put in there as a sensor will monitor the life and the performance of the product. And it will tell you how much life is remaining. And at the end of life, when we recover this product, dismantle or disassemble this product into components, and each component will have a life story, then we can decide very easily how to reuse these components that are coming from recovery process, or how to re-manufacture these components, or how to even recycle these components. So that knowledge will come in the form of digital technology planted into the component. So that's going to take probably another 10, 15 years to make it universally available. But the technology is there right now at low level. At the process level, we are developing these processes that I showed in a couple of slides, like cryogenic technologies, where you can make the cleanest possible technology, which is the cryogenic manufacturing processes. It's not just applied to machining. It's applied to metal forming, applied to welding, applied to non-traditional manufacturing processes. And uh, folks in uh, Europe uh, who collaborated with me on a recent cryogenic manufacturing paper, both in uh, England as well as in Belgium, they come up with these uh, sheet metal working operations, cryogenically processed to create nanostructures. Nanostructures are sustainable structures, making products from sustainable technologies. That's an, an advancement that my institute is involved in. At the system level, I showed one slide where my colleague, Professor Badudin, is involved in sustainable supply chain to look into the upstream and downstream uh, suppliers, first level, second level, third level, third tier suppliers. To, when you think of an automotive manufacturing operation or even aerospace manufacturing, you can bring in hundreds of manufacturers together to have the information available for them to have access to and process that and use it in a digital, digital fashion to feed back into the product and process development involves the whole supply chain. So some of our colleagues, including Professor Badudi, who is leading the effort, some of my younger colleagues are involved in that activity. More recently, we had a faculty also uh, to develop machine learning and deep learning technologies to apply it. 
And these are some of the activities that we will be able to share with you uh, if you have some interest or send some students or, or some of you can come and spend some time with us on sabbatical. That's a good way to get joint publications and, and organize some workshops and conferences. Sorry okay. for the long answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof. Jawai for the answer, for your sharing. Uh, one last question. We, know we, are, we are a bit short on time. One last question. Okay. This is from our colleague from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Prof. Zuraida. Prof, the process. Oh, yeah, you can read it. Maybe you can you give know, a short. First of all, let me let me thank for this question. Thank for this question. Prof. Zuraida Abdul Wahab is very, very close to us. Both me and Dr. Baduji know her very well, and she's done outstanding work in uh, product design and sustainable system. We really appreciate all her good work. This question reads as uh, the progress in remanufacturing is very slow in Malaysia. I do agree with that uh, comment. And can you advise? This is um, uh, again a million dollar question. I know there has been some effort uh, that uh, was initiated by uh, UKM where. Uh, Professor Zureid Abdul Wahab is working and also your colleague uh, uh, at uh, your UTM campus, uh, younger Dr. colleague, Halim. Halim, Halim. Halim Shah, and initiated a series of workshops. And I think you have a working group there. I attended uh, some of the meetings uh, that they organized, uh, me and Professor Zeliga and some European colleagues, including some colleagues from Italy. Remanufacturing is, uh, in my opinion, is the sixth element of the six R which is something I call crown in the jewel. The crown in the jewel is the very last aspect. People fail to recognize the fact that remanufacturing is the last stage, last most beneficial stage. Before you get to remanufacturing, you need to be able to understand and implement the first five R's. If you saw my animated diagram that I showed in one of the slides, the six R people try to jump into, actually Singapore made that uh, attempt also. I think it's, uh, in my opinion, it's a mistake to jump into remanufacturing without understanding, reducing, reusing, recycling, redesigning, and recovering. All of this had to be understood. The last option is taking the benefit of all the information coming in through the digital revolution into remanufacturing. I know the remanufacturing is booming in some places, even in my small city where I live here, there is a company called SRC. Many of you probably know they re-engine, re remanufacture automotive engines, and they are very profitable companies. But more recently, they have implemented these uh, six R concepts. Six R concepts, I think, uh, if it is logically done, it can be successful not just for uh, Malaysia, for for the region and internationally also. That's my uh, simple answer to your question, uh, Zureda. And uh, we can collaborate on that area if you if you can. Uh, uh, find an opportunity to uh, work with us and, and send some students and maybe we can even publish papers together. Thank you so uh, much. All the best. Maybe one short answer to this last question, Prof. Yes. Prof, this is uh, Adnan Hassan. Yeah. Uh, thank okay. you for interesting and informative talk, Prof. Jawahir. And uh, can you comment on the support of governments in various countries? in realizing sustainable manufacturing slash circular. Who is leading? This is a difficult question to answer. You know, the countries are divided into two or three different worlds. One is called developed world, G7, G8, or G20, they call it now. The other one is developing world or emerging world. The third group is underdeveloped world. Unfortunately, we are stuck with these uh, uh, three levels. These are discriminatory levels. And uh, if I have to give you an answer to the developed world where I am living in, uh, recently, actually a few years ago, as I mentioned at the beginning, I uh, presented, I, uh, I made a presentation at the European Union Horizon 2020. There was a European Union project. They invited me to go to Brussels in Belgium. And I learned uh, something about what they do in that uh, collaborative project in between, uh, I think about 12 different countries in Europe. And, uh, and the developed world, is focusing on sustainable manufacturing at much more aggressive pace than the developing and underdeveloped world. Developing world, including countries like India, for a, as a matter of fact, I must tell you the truth, an Indian Prime Minister Modi, a few years ago, went to beat the drum for 6R. Can you believe it? This is the truth. 
and he used our sitsar concepts in one of the conferences in dubai few years ago he didn't give credit to us he showed as though it was invented in india that was wrong and he said six r is the basis for developing countries like india and of course the brazilian government is very much active in six r also i must tell you uh, the brics countries brazil russia india uh, china and um, and 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 uh, more recently they added also south africa to these brics countries they are very active in six r concepts and uh, level of de develop level of uh, development is uh, different in, in different countries because the resources available and expertise available i think countries like malaysia can really take advantage of the intellectual base that you have you are intellectually very strong and very powerful your professors are as good as any other professors anywhere else in the world you publish in the same journals you go to the same conferences you are as good of a leader as anywhere else i think what's needed is a government to provide some support for you i know malaysian government is very progressive they have they have done very many good things and you still have to achieve some more and and the combination of uh, these uh, resources in between different universities instead of uh, competing collaborating is a key to go and if you want some of our developed world also to come together with you i think we are there to help you sorry for the long answer professor nurdin okay. you want a short you. answer Prof. Jawair, actually, there's another question, but I think we have to stop now uh, okay. because we, have, you know, exceeded our one-hour limit. Okay. Uh, so again, on behalf of the Faculty of Engineering, University of Technology, Malaysia, we would like to thank you, Professor Jawahir for the very inspiring, informative talk on the leading edge research being conducted in sustainable manufacturing. So. Uh, thank you very very much. Uh, well, our dean is there, so maybe I'll I'll pass it over to our dean, Dato Rafiq, to say a few words uh, at the end. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, thank you, Professor Nordin, for chairing the session, and of course, thank you so very much to our distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Jawahir, uh, all the way from Lexington, United States of America for accepting our invitation to speak at our Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Jawahir, uh, you talk about the, the plants over, over there in, in your room, yeah? So, so I took uh, something like 15 minutes drive from my office to here. We are still here in UTM, just to show you the backdrop. Beautiful. So Very yeah. green and beautiful. Yeah, so this is it, is, it is a real, real uh, forest we have here in UTM, yeah? I know you you are living in a real world actually it's beautiful malaysia is such a rich beautiful uh, country and it's not just rich with uh, expertise and capabilities also rich in uh, soil and plants and vegetation you are very blessed with all the vegetation there that's one of the reasons i want to come back again thank you prof jawahir you are always welcome to come back here so again thank prof so thank you so very much for a very interesting and very important lecture and thank you again professor nurdin for chairing the session and to all of you watching this webinar utm engineering distinguished lecture series do stay tuned because we have many more is, uh, interesting lectures for you until then bye bye for now bye bye thank you so much thank you bye, thank you. bye.